Psychobiotics. Yes. A term. What is that? Because I think a lot of people have heard about probiotics, and we've just spoken about that, yeah. and you've seen very kind of for probiotics, especially if somebody's had antibiotics or if they're on any type of medication and treatment um, to take them. And we spoke about fiber, which is yep. a prebiotic and kind of that fertilizer for the gut and kind of, you know, yep. increase that slowly up yep. to 30 grams a day. Psychobiotics. Yeah. What's that? People might not have heard of that before. Psychobiotics. So a psychobiotic is a... Um, living organism that when taken has a proven health benefit on your mental health specifically and it's this idea that if we assume that we have just done that the gut and the brain are mechanistically linked in both their development and their aging process but also in in regulating your day-to-day -day mood that we might be able to take specific strains that um, interfere with that mechanism for our own benefit so for example for treating depression for treating anxiety and for treating these problems and there is some very interesting experimental evidence in animals that you can take particular strains and it might actually have an impact on not just things like depression, but actually things like um, things like uh, autistic, autistic spectrum condition symptoms or behaviours that are really profound or indeed things like the treatment of addiction. The problem, and there's always a problem, isn't there? The problem is, is that these animal studies do not translate well to human studies because the human microbiome is so much more diverse, so much more sophisticated, so much more vulnerable to external variation and external influence that actually single strains don't seem to be quite so effective. And um, the other caveat is that it's a super early area of science. And um, so we need to give it a little bit more time. So at the moment, I can't say to you, hey, take these strains for depression because there's an evidence base to support it that just does not exist. Mm. But they're a supplement form. Well, what you're seeing is you're starting to see them being sold and marketed, right? Mm -hmm. So start, it doesn't really matter about the science. People would just market it anyway. Mm -hmm. So you're starting to see it. But, but I you would... can't get them in a food. It's a supplement more than correct, anything. Correct, correct. Okay. Exactly right. So you take it in yeah. a caps and you take it in a formula. But my, uh, probiotic science is evolving, right? Mm -hmm. Evol super, super fast. So we're now getting into an age where actually... Um, we're discovering probiotic strains not from the environment or from animal studies. We're discovering them from human studies and we're beginning to engineer bacteria. So we're beginning to apply this kind of science called synthetic biology to recode bacteria, to do things that we really want. And that's important because at the moment probiotics are classed as foods. They're foodstuffs, right? And they're regulated as foods. Um, but they're probably in future going to be regulated as medicines. So next generation, what we call second generation probiotic strains, will be they'll be under they they will be prescribed by your doctors and given for you in a in a in a very different and targeted way. And to be honest, that's what we need because the consumer problem with probiotics is they just don't know which one to take and for why. And the evidence base is so confusing and overwhelming for doctors, let alone for consumers, that actually we're just taking strains hoping that they work, and sometimes they just don't. Fecal transplant. Okay. Let's just get straight to poo. Let's do it. Because <laughs> I find this totally fascinating. And please correct me if I'm wrong, because I haven't written sure. this down, but it's something that I remember reading. Was it true that they took a fecal transplant and from somebody who was autistic or neurodivergent and put it into a animal and yeah. that transferred the neurodivergent traits? Correct. Yeah. That is mind blowing. It's mad, isn't it? Yeah. Where is the landscape now on faecal transplants? I'm just thinking, I've got a niece and nephew who are autistic. Mm -hmm. Now, would they grow up to potentially swap their microbiomes with somebody who hasn't got autism? And would that then mean that they wouldn't have autism? I mean, I know this is a very long stretched answer, but I'm thinking ahead in the future. Like, yeah. is this is what we're getting to? So the answer is no. And I'll explain why. Okay. Okay. So, so. Um, just for some of your viewers that may not know what faecal transplant is, it, it is as gross as you think it is. Uh, so effectively what you're doing is answering the question you previously put to me. You said to me, like, how do people improve their microbiomes? There are some people that maybe they just cannot, right? Their microbiomes are so scarred, they're so damaged that you can't. And the idea is, is that what you need is a wholesale change in ecology. We're going to take the ecology of a healthy person and put it into someone who's not very well. So in practice... We treat it like any other donation of any other organ. So you, you make a donation, but that donation is based on the idea that you're healthy. And we screen you, and then we screen for pathogens within the sample. 
Then what we do is we effectively put that sample in a Magimix with a bit of saline, and it's kind of like that, although we're getting better at manufacturing it. Uh, and then we administer it sometimes through a nasogastric tube, which is a tube that goes in your nose into your stomach, or sometimes it's given by an enema or a colonoscopy. And increasingly, it's now taken as crapsules, so we can freeze dry it. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's what a name. Dry, what a name. Uh, and you, can, you take it orally. And actually, fecal transplantation has been used historically for thousands of years, famously so. But actually, it's also been used for hundreds of years as an experimental tool for understanding how bugs influence human health. And there are about 420 odd plus trials now around the world in humans for fecal transplantation in conditions as diverse as autism, uh, uh, peanut allergies through to uh, ca cancer care and, um, you know, inflammatory bowel disease, the whole, the whole shooting match. Um, now, what's interesting about the specific example that you raised, which is neurodivergency and neurodevelopment, is that we are beginning to understand that the brain and the gut develop together. And there seem to be quite startling, there's a startling overlap between how the microbiome evolves and how the brain evolves and how the microbiome shapes brain development and how brain development shapes gut development, because it's a two-way street. And fecal transplant has been used as a tool for trying to understand that relationship. And you're completely right. They did a bunch of studies where they took twins who were who were genetically identical, but but, um, but one had autism and one didn't. And they were able to do fecal transplant into an animal model that was genetically bred to be susceptible to autism. And what they found is that when the autistic twins feces was put in, the animal developed autism. And when the lean twins, uh, sorry, the autistic, uh, the non-divergent um, uh, neurotypical twin feces was put in, actually that resolved the symptoms of autism. There are some caveats to this. The first is, is that that effect, most interestingly to me, was only found before weaning. After weaning, the effect stops, which is extremely important because it says, look, there is a moment, there's a window where you can engineer the microbiome to influence brain development. Perhaps after that window was closed, it might be very difficult to reverse it. Um, and, the, you know, the second caveat to that is that only specific behavioral traits were transferred. So what we have to acknowledge is, is that autistic spectrum condition or other neurodivergent conditions are under lots of different control mechanisms. Some are genetically controlled and some are, you know, more, more, more vulnerable to environmental changes. So it's not quite as simple as, you know, as that. But what we know is that many children with autistic spectrum condition have abnormal gut function. Many of that is defined because they have um, particular eating habits, which are perhaps a symptom of their condition. But even when you account for that, we know their guts are different, their microbiomes are different. And we know that actually many of the microbes that are different seem to be very important precursor produ producers for neurotransmitters and things that seem to be important in brain development. So it's an interesting area where we might be able to say, look, we've got a new target suddenly. We've got a new way that we can develop um, perhaps protective methods for protecting the, the development of autism, but also for treating its worst symptoms. Same thing exists, by the way, in neurodegenerative conditions. Same thing it condition, it exists in conditions of brain aging, right? So with Alzheimer's and dementia, this Correct. could, you could Correct. wow. Same effect, right? Because it's mediated by the immune system and bugs are the puppets of the immune system. Bugs produce amyloid. They produce these proteins that we find in the brains of people with Alzheimer's. We find oral microbes produce lots of proteins that seem to be overly abundant in people with Alzheimer's. So the gut-brain axis is so critical, it's so important because it gives us a new way to prevent and to treat these conditions of the brain by leveraging the microbiome. And, and that's really exciting. So do you think that's where some Alzheimer's or dementia and on a whole treatment is going to start going on fecal transplant? Well, I think, I think so the thing with fecal transplant is that it's a, um, it's a blunt instrument. Right. You'll get, we don't really know how and why it works. We're getting better at it. We're doing a bunch of trials working it out. But actually, it may be that you don't have to give the whole community. It may be that the thing that's having effect is these things, this dark matter that we talked about at the beginning of our conversation. Right. We just don't know what it is. But it might be that actually we don't need to give the whole e ecosystem. We can just give specific communities, specific networks of microbes or even the things that they make and that they produce. So what you will see is that we will begin to synthesize these kind of communities of microbes into targeted therapies. And the evolution of all of this science is that actually we're going to start making drugs to target the microbiome. So instead of making medicines that are designed to, uh, you know, uh, attack our genomes or to address, you know, failures in our own biology, we're just leveraging and targeting the microbiome instead. And therefore, I think microbiome, you know, FMT is, that's why I said no to your answer. Has so anything ever gone wrong 
with FMT. Yeah, totally. So in the early days, we had problems where pathogens were being, they were, get, they were getting through the screening process and we had, there were some deaths in the United States from that because quite often you're giving it through a nasogastric tube. Um, you know, you can have complications from doing that if the nasogastric tube is in the wrong place. But you also see these kind of weird and wonderful side effects. Because the microbiome is so important for uh, determining so many of our health aspects, some people after FMTs become obese. Some have, wow. there was an interesting story that was in the lay press uh, a few weeks ago about a young guy with Crohn's disease having an FMT and his, his FMT was given to him by his mother and he started developing symptoms of the menopause because she was on HRT. So you, we've got weird case reports of people with um, alopecia, so they're completely bald and their hair suddenly grows back. And, and that's actually the critical point. It's another reason why I've said no to you. It might be that we are with the best intent treating people with FMT to treat a, you know, a chronic condition for which there is no cure. But it might be that we are inadvertently setting them up on trajectory for chronic disease state that we don't fully understand. Yeah. Right. It's so so new. it is an experimental tool, which is why mm. health warning, please don't give yourself your own FMT. <laughs> don't please don't go on YouTube and do it please because there don't are just don't it. just please don't do it. Yeah. I, and I, if you are just like, oh, because there are people out there doing it right? and it's, mad, it's absolute madness. Right. So I think it's it is an experimental tool that should only be given in a regulated way by clinicians that really understand who are kind of properly you know, ethically approved to, mm -hmm. to do it. Thank you so much for listening to the show. The link to the full episode is in the description. <laughs>